Hey there, this is Dr. Dan Guerra coming to you from Verev Med and Authentic Biochemistry Studios in the Inland Pacific Northwest. This is the 10th of December, 2019, and I'm going to provide for you the last, I think, of the video lectures on the prolegomena to T-cell diet event ontological perspectives. If you don't know what that means and you're viewing uh, lecture six, I really recommend you go back and look at the first five lectures because that will give you a lot more detail about where we're at today. So without any uh, more persuasive argument to get you to listen to this uh, lovely talk, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. All right. So again, T-cell diet of logic six, lecture six, that's the date. There is my Facebook page. We can find all of these published lectures uh, on video, as well as my Authentic Biochemistry podcast. Uh, and in fact, there are the two logos for the two companies I run, Verev Med and Authentic Biochemistry. Verev Med with a colleague, Authentic Biochemistry, and a solo uh, effort to get as much information as I can to the public, particularly even to the lay public as it relates to um, the precise nature of published scientific research as it supports not only fundamental general biochemistry, physiology, molecular genetics, but also how it supports biomedicine. And that's what we do here at Verev Med and also at Authentic Biochemistry. We inform the biomedical com community on what's going on in the brand new published research in the referee journals uh, of which uh, I read regularly and take apart, dissect, analyze, and ultimately verify the data against the corpus of other information that is related to that specific discipline or subdiscipline in, in any of those biochemistry, molecular genetics, physiology, pathophysiology, but then also as it relates to biomedicine, according to uh, clients who are interested in knowing things like drug-drug interactions, uh, new research, for example, in PD, PDL1, uh, in immuno checkpoint inhibition of cancers, cardiovascular disease, uh, metabolic diseases like type 2 diabetes, as well as auto inflammatory diseases, which are going to be the topic very next time we meet. And that's going to be, of course, on my Authentic Biochemistry podcast, since I've set the stage for all of this uh, for discussion of. T cell responses, which is give, giving you, a, I think, a rather thorough background on how T cells and B cells, and of course, all the innate immune responses, some of which are actually innate lymphocytic cells, which I've covered at great length over the last five lectures. Let's just get started. Those are the down there is where you can find the podcast, and here is where you can find my YouTube, where all these lectures are, of course, embedded. Just look for Dr. Dan Guerra. That's me. Okay. So this comes from a paper published in International Immunopharmacology. There's a citation a few years back. This is looking at Echinococcus multilocaris, okay? So multilocularis is a helminthic disorder. It's a parasitic disease caused by infection with the tapeworm. And that's the genus Echinococcus. And it is classified as either a cystic echino cocosidosis or an alveolar echinococcosidosis, excuse me. So I want you to take a look at this. The reason I'm showing you this is look at the difference in T cell response. Forget the fact that I couldn't get that species name just exactly right. Forgive me. I didn't practice it, I will admit. But I want you to take a look at what happens to T cell responses as they relate to extension into the parasitic infection, okay? Going from the very early stages when the organism is just now, you, you usually ingest eggs. This is a fecal oral transmission. Early stages between day two and day eight to the middle stages going all the way to about three months and then the late stages well into almost three quarters or, or more of a year. Now check out what happens to the T cell response. That's what we're looking at here, okay? Put me over there. Uh, TGF beta binds to its receptor, okay? And that phosphorylates itself on tyrosine residues. And then it mediates the phosphorylation of the SMAD23, which is basically a co-transcription factor. Glasses on. 
That SMAD23 then interacts with the FOXP3 transcription factor as well as the ROAR gamma T. And depending on the cell type, either the increase in interleukin-6 will allow for TH17, as T helper cell 17s, to be activated. And they'll start generating their canonical um, uh, signature cytokine, pro-inflammatory cytokine, interleukin-17, amongst others. And that's going to induce an inflammatory response right in the middle of the infection of this uh, tapeworm, okay? Now, watch what also happens at the middle of the stages where you have FOXP3 mediated activation of Treg cells, right? Those are the regulatory cells, used to be called suppressor cells. They're going to make more TGF beta, but they're also going to make interleukin-10. And what's going to happen is you're going to get an immune tolerance. Now, why is that important? It's because immune tolerance will mean that the infection of this particular parasitic tapeworm will not be completely eliminated. Now, you might think, why would the immune response allow for coactivation of Treg and Th17? One, to eliminate the tapeworm at various stages of its life cycle, uh, which we'll get into in a moment, or the Treg, which is going to suppress the Th17, and in fact, either Th1 and Th2 responses as well, which can also be induced and infiltrated into this immune response against this parasitic infection. Now, what I'm saying is this. Whenever you induce an immune response, you automatically trigger essentially an anti-immune response. And we call that regulation from Treg cells. You also have various ways for the, uh, the um, pro-inflammatory T cell responses from Th lineage to automatically as well decrease in their activation. And this does so by typical processes, including autophagy, and indeed apoptosis of those cell lineages. But the T regulatory cells work through and in tandem with the other TH lineage, which is usually pro-inflammatory, like TH17 here, to suppress <laughs> the regulation of communication between the T cells. And this includes chemokines and cytokines. So uh, interleukin-10 is a really important cytokine, which is going to mediate the suppression of the TH17 response. You see, now look what happens later on. Later on, you get complete immune tolerance because TGF-beta is still binding its receptor because you made a lot of it from the Treg cells, okay? You're still inducing this phosphorylation of SMAD. SMAD23 is making it to the nucleus. But there's more FOXP3 now that was previously transcribed in the Treg cells in the middle stage of the infection. So because you have a higher expression of FOXP3, which again is the transcription factor, you're going to make more interleukin-10, more TGF-beta, and you're going to induce a higher level of Treg activation as compared to in ratio and proportion to the TH17 cell lineage. So what you have is less interleukin-17, so you have an immune tolerance. So once the infection is fully laid in, okay, fully laid in, what happens is that you get an elimination of what you normally would want. What you would normally want is, of course, suppression of the infection, not suppression of the inflammation, right? So this is a way for this parasitic infection to actually elude the immune response. Now it does it by altering the relative ratios of the different T cell lineages and then how they relate to the innate immune response. Part of it has to do with immune evasion, but also it has to do with immune manipulation by the parasite. Now, I'm not going to get into that today. I just wanted to sell, show you how a timeline of an infection of a common human parasite, the tapeworm, can be understood related to how T cells respond. And depending on when that infection is involved in its life cycle of the tapeworm, and while it's in the host, the human, you're going to get a different response from T-cell lineage. So let's take a look now at that um, overall uh, infection, okay? So this is cystic echinococcus, okay? Echinococcus granulosus sensulatus, okay? So now the definitive host for the tapeworm is the dog, Okay, so let's take a look at this in some detail. So the adult resides in the small intestine of the definitive. This is the adult parasite here. This is the tapeworm. And it's inside the intestine of the definitive host, which could be your 
uh, family dog, okay? So the dog is then going to shed, okay, uh, embryonated egg in the feces from the adult. The adult is going to be making these eggs, right? It's going to be reproducing inside the intestine of the dog. That's what can get ingested by the human indirectly, of course, because the dog feces is outside. The dog feces can get out of a person's shoe. The eggs can be transmitted into the house. Somewhere or other, something can be uh, aerosol or some other means. Those eggs can somehow make it into uh, onto a plate, and some of those eggs can be ingested. Of course, if you have little children, they're always getting dirty, or even people can get their hands dirty from touching various surfaces. Some of those surfaces can have embryonic, embryonated eggs uh, from fecal matter from the dog, and then there you are ripe for infection. I know that's gross to say, but that's exactly how it happens. So you have gravid proglottids. They release immediately infectious eggs, and they pass into the feces of the dog. That's what that uh, particular infectious stage of the adult is in the dog, and the thin post, okay? Now, what happens is that after ingestion by a suitable intermediate host, that would be us, humans, the eggs hatch in the small intestine of the human and release a six-hooked oncosphere <coughs> that penetrates the intestinal wall and migrates through the circulatory system into various organs, unfortunately, especially the liver and the lung in the human, right? That's now the host, the intermediate host. So that's stage three. Stage four, then, you can see that starting these uh, particular uh, oncospheres are being translocated throughout the human body, right? And those organs where we're talking, liver and lungs, right? Highly aerobic, highly active organs in the body. The oncosphere develops into a thick-walled hydatid cyst, okay? So the hydatid cyst then is generated, and there it is, right? And find that in various organs. In fact, you can find it in another intermediate host in sheep. So people who raise sheep can pick up the hydatid cyst and that then that hydatid cyst can then uh, ultimately uh, be picked up by the dog and then the dog can then mature the parasite into an adult and you're back into the life cycle. So you have two intermediate hosts. You have the sheep, you have the human, and then you have the definitive host is the dog, which makes the adult. Only the dog makes the adult form. That's why it's called the definitive host, right? Okay. That's what the eggs are actually shed. So you see the cycle is quite complex. So you can understand too why something like a sheep ranch with dogs, and you usually have dogs around sheep ranches to keep away things like coyotes and wolves and maybe wolverines or whatever else might be uh, uh, preying on the sheep out in the pasture, out in the uh, wildlife area where you have your sheep foraging, right, grazing. So you have a perfect two uh, intermediate hosts and one definitive host, and you have a perfect life cycle for this terrible parasite, right? And that's exactly what's, what is going on here. So anyway, what happens then is that this hydatid cyst enlarges into protoscolices uh, and daughter cysts that fill the cyst interior. The definitive host becomes infected again by ingesting the cyst-containing organs of the infected intermediate host. So the dog can eat the organs. So a lot of times when you slaughter sheep, uh, particularly in areas that have a lot of this, where they're, where they're raising the sheep for meat, not just for the wool, you're going to have the animals, you're going to have some of the organ uh, organs of that sheep given to the dogs. That's how they pick up. That's how they ingest the cyst, and that's how they become the definitive host to make the adult. See, then that's how it works, right? So anyways, to finish this life cycle from the hydatid cyst and the various organs, where it can go into an intermediate host, uh, the intermediate host is going to be slaughtered, let's say, out in the field, you're going to the ingestion of some of the cysts and the organs from the intermediate host from the dog. The dog then is going to mature uh, the parasite into the adult. It's going to start making the embryonated eggs. The eggs can be picked up in the feces by the human. Um, Oncospheres can be uh, hatched, and you finish the life cycle again. But going on with the hydatid cyst, you can also get this protoscolex from the cyst, and then ultimately the scolex attaches to the intestine, and that's ultimately how the definitive host can also pick it up. And that's the, that's the finishing of the life cycle. So after ingestion, the protoscolices invaginate, attach to the intestinal mucosa, and develop into adult stages in 32 to 80 days. Now go back and remember these stages. This is right in the middle of the immune response. So the dog has very similar uh, T cell responses that humans do. So the dog is also starting to get immune tolerant. And by this later stages, it's completely immune tolerant as is the human. So go back to this slide. So you're going to be 
playing around with the T cell response to try to eliminate this parasite. At the same time, the parasite is going through multiple ocular infection stages because it's in a cycle between two intermediate hosts, you and the sheep, for example, or probably any other um, uh, ungulate uh, like a cow, but the sheep is the most consi is the most common immediate host, or maybe even wildlife like elk and deer, right? Elk and deer organ meat. If when you go hunting, you feed it to the dogs. The dogs can pick up the cysts, and the cysts can go on their merry way to finish a life cycle through the scolices, the protoscolices, and ultimately making the adult, making the eggs, and then you're back to it. Right? So this is really important. So humans are actually the aberrant intermediate hosts because they're usually not in this life cycle, but because we raise sheep, we are, right? So if this was a elk or a deer, and this would be where only humans occasionally penetrate that environment, say when we go camping or hunting or just hiking, then we're gonna be uh, caught into that, especially if we're walking with our dogs, right? So you see how this works. You see how this can be a really important um, potential for uh, getting the tapeworm. So we have our house, get infected by ingesting the eggs. The oncospheres are released into the intestine. The hydatid cysts develop in various organs, as I just said. If cyst ruptures, the liberated protoscolices may create secondary cysts and other sites within the body. And that's a secondary form of the disease, right? So basically you're reinfecting yourself. So I want to show you how complicated it is that the T cell response itself, because you're activating different T cell lineages, even in a very common parasitic infections such as with uh, the tapeworm, it can be, that, that is the immune system can be aberrated in such a way because if it's normal transmission of going from immune suppression to immune tolerance so that you don't get an autoimmune response after the initial induction of the immune response, the TH17 response. That's why it normally works that way. All right, so let's go back now to talking just about T cells. So you've got Naive CD4 T cells that can be in the presence of interleukin 12 or interleukin 18 turns to TH1 lineage with the expression of TBET and STAT1, which is going to be a protein in the middle of the pathway, and TBET is going to be a transcription factor. You're going to make a lot of interferon gamma. That's going to attack intracellular pathogens, and it's going to utilize the, the innate immune responses of macrophages. It's going to give you an inflammatory response. Okay, that's TH1. TH2 responses uh, from CD4 cells in the presence of interleukin-4, and then expressing the GATA3 and STAT6, the transcription factors and signal transduction cascade factors, are going to make all of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, 4, 5, and 13. That's going to attack the helminths, okay? And you're going to have an association with that other innate cells, the mast cells and cinephils, and it's also the allergic response that you get because eventually eosinophils may be triggered. The CD4 T cell can also, in the presence of TGF beta, which we just looked at, make TH17. In the presence of the ROR gamma T, or just the ROR C, which again is retinoic acid orphan receptor transcription factor, which utilizes retinoic acid, that lipid as a component to activate that transcription factor, move it to the nucleus, and then cause the expression of genes. What genes, like interleukin 23 and interleukin 17, and even in the presence of 23 and STAT3, you're going to make a frank TH17 cell that's going to be involved in extracellular bacteria and fungi, and it's going to be making interleukin-17, its canonical signature uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine. It's also going to make a lot of 22, and it's going to be involved with making neutrophils and autoimmune diseases triggered. So that's why we're going to go back and look at TH17 in, a few minutes, in, in subsequent lectures. Finally, we just talked to you about in the presence of a dendritic cell, angiopresenting cell, Naive CD4 cells, okay, all of these are going to be triggered by this CD4. Remember that T cells don't work. Um, uh, they, they, they work by communicating with um, compounds that are secreted in the environment, right? So that's the way they function. They don't work directly. They have to have intermediates, right? So in the presence of TGF beta and SMAD, which we just looked at, remember that SMAD 2, 3? We looked at TH17 versus Treg cells in the last slide. You either have interleukin-6 or you have interleukin-2. Interleukin-2 are really important. It's actually a pro-inflammatory cytokine, but it binds to the surface of these pro-Treg cells, right? And when it does so, what happens is that you make more FOXP3 and then you make TGF-beta interleukin-10, then you get immune tolerance. Or in the presence of interleukin-6 and then STAT-3 as an intermediate in the pathway, you make the rare, rare gamma T transcription factor, 
presence of this pro-inflammatory cytokine and this um, cohering transcription factor mediated response. You make Frank TH17 cells, and I just told you what happens there. And that's what's all written down here. TH17 cells uh, secrete a distinctive set of immunoregulatory cytokines, including 17A, F, 22, and 21. All of those cytokines collectively play roles in inflammatory and autoimmunity, okay? And elimination of extracellular bacteria and fungal pathogens. That's their main purpose, right? Immature TH17 cells are differentiated by TGF beta, and leukin 6, and leukin 23, as we just saw. Transcription factors involved in helper T cell differentiation. I just showed you, okay. So this leads us now to kind of complete the cycle of these lectures, talking, going back to nuclear factor and leukin-3 transcription factor, uh, conveniently and fondly known as infill-3. That gene is a nuclear factor. It's also known as interleukin-3 regulated, interleukin-3 promoter transcriptional activator, nuclear factor-3, uh, interleukin-3 regulated protein, protein transcriptional activator, NFIL3A, and also interleukin-3 binding protein and E4 promoter binding protein. So all pseudonyms for the same gene product, okay? In the literature, you're gonna find all of them and you have to keep track the fact you're talking about the same protein. So it's a transcription factor, this is summarizes, that recognizes and binds to a specific sequence, that GATA type sequence, uh, which is present in many cellular and viral promoters. Isn't that interesting? It represses transcription from those promoters, so it can repress viral replication directly, isn't that interesting, <coughs> by activating transcription factor sites called ATFs. Okay. It activates transcription from an interleukin-3 promoter in T cells. That's how it's functioning in T cells. The component, it's also, this infill 3 is a component of the circadian clock that acts as a negative regulator of circadian expression of something called the PER2, which is one of the clock genes which regulates sleep cycles in mammals. So it regulates the circadian, that means a 24 hour fluctuation or oscillation of this PER2 protein, which regulates sleep wake cycles in mammals like humans. Finally, the infill 3 also protects proto B cells from, pro, from PCD, from apoptosis. So there's a lot of functions in immune cells, but also has a direct function on neuroendocrine axes, as well as the sleep-wake cycle, which involves a tremendous amount of activity, um, both in molecular pathways, that is um, uh, bioenergetic pathways in different cell lineages during sleep and wake cycles, and also in the regulation of that cycle and all the immune suppression, immune activation that can go on while you're sleeping. So, in fact, here's a paper I just pulled from Brain Behavior Immunology 2019, published just a few months ago. Well, March 6th, this is December 10th, so more than a few months, six months ago, I guess. Now, this is what this paper basically says, so follow me when I go through it. There's a circadian dysfunction, and that's a core manifestation of risk factor for many psychiatric disorders, okay? There is a compound called Ramelteon, or RMT, which is a melatonin receptor agonist. Okay, so it works like melatonin, which is a normal regulator or neuroregulator of the sleep-wake cycle in mammals. So Ramel Ramelteon, or RMT, is an agonist that you can get from the pharmacy upon, upon prescription from a physician. That's been shown to induce sleep phase shifts and has been used to normalize sleep onset time. So that drug can sometimes be prescribed for people that have, um, for example, problems falling asleep, right? Insomnia. Insomnia or sleep-wake cycles that are corrupted or dysfunctional are sometimes associated with psychiatric disorders like major depressive disorder and GAD or general anxiety disorder, okay? So RMT, that compound you can get from pharmacy, has been used in sleep disorders, depression, and anxiety. So it may positively regulate the expression of the certain circadian clock genes, but also inflammatory and neuroplasticity genes, okay? Because it's gonna link up to that infill discussion we just had, and I'll show you how. So this particular paper was actually a, a study done with human subjects. 16 patients with primary insomnia, comorbid with depression and anxiety disorder, and then 10 healthy controls were recruited in what was called an eight-week open-label trial. Open-label means that they knew whether or not they were getting placebo. 
The patients with primary insomnia received the RMT, which was about at the level of dose eight milligram per day. The morning expression levels of 15 core clock genes then were examined in peripheral blood mononuclear cells and urine and plasma levels of melatonin and its metabolite to see whether or not melatonin itself was being altered because of using this agonist. And the plasma inflammatory markers, which we'll talk about in a moment, plus neurotrophin levels, all of that were evaluated at baseline four and eight weeks after the RMT treatment. Okay. All right. The RMT treatment improved depression scores at week eight, which was the end of this study. Look at the Hamilton depression rating score, starting from a 21.5 plus or minus 2.44 rating scale all the way down to 14.31. So it, it decreased it significantly, right? Uh, and you can see the p-value there is really low. So it looks like even with this very small number of patients, it tremendously decreased the Hamilton depression rating score using this RMT, presumably because it helped regulate a good sleep-wake cycle. Okay. The overall poor sleep quality, which was you can measure by using something called the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. They recommend that to psychologists and psychiatrists when they want to know if their patients have indeed poor sleep quality. Uh, and it significantly improved that particular quality index, the Pittsburgh uh, Quality Index, following that RMT treatment, following that agonist, that melatonin agonist. Now, what is specifically are we looking at here? I'm a biochemist, so we want to know. At the transcription level, mRNA, analysis showed a significant association between RMT treatment, that remember is a melatonin receptor agonist, and alterations of nine core circadian genes, clock itself, PER1, PER2. Remember, PER2 is regulated by what? Infill 3, uh, CRY1 and 2, NR1D1 and D2, DEC1, and the gene called Timeless, which totally disrupts sleep-wake cycles. Uh, and that's in the patient group when compared to control group, okay? So there's a significant association there in the patient group. That's really important. Now, prior to treatment, this is what you need to know. The patient group had a decrease in neurotrophins, for, for example, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, also glial cell line neurotrophic factor, and the beta nerve uh, uh, BNGF, all at very low levels. Okay, there was a decrease for people who suffered from depression, anxiety, who also had insomnia, according to the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. Okay, and then the Hamilton scores for the other, um, for the neuropsychiatric problem, particularly depression. All right, so that was normal what was going on. But there was also an increase at baseline of depressed, anxious patients, neuropsychiatric patients who also have insomnia. Uh, and how was that measured? By looking at pro-inflammatory cytokine levels in the blood, and look at six, one beta, two mitocrosis factor alpha, and of course, interferon gamma. They're all pro-inflammatory cytokines. RMT treatment normalized the levels of the neurotrophins, bring those up, and lowered the levels of cytokines and then also decreased that Hamilton score and corrected some of the insomnia. So it's really interesting that agonizing the melatonin receptor had all of these very positive effects. And that paper, of course, needs to be reproduced. We need to take a look at this in a much larger cohort, cross-sectional analysis, and not just looking at 16, but maybe looking at 6,000 or 1,600 people, right? Now, here's another paper I want you to look at. This is now, so what I'm doing is I'm starting to develop a diet event ontologic of infill 3. This is how I do it, okay? So I told you how infill 3 regulates, right, by suppressing T regulatory cells. And we know that it's a transcription factor. It's binding to that GATA box. And I told you that it involves control of clock genes. I just told you, showed you a clock gene paper. Okay, by looking at melatonin, they weren't studying infill, but you better believe that infill is involved in that normal regulation, right? They just didn't study it there. Subsequent study could, you see. That's the potency of using a diet event ontological paradigm to start putting together experimental design, right? All right, now here's another paper I want you to think about. Cell Cycle published about five years ago. There's a citation. There's a link between circadian rhythm disturbances and tumorigenesis. It's been known for a long time, more than the five years from that paper. Higher expression of clock genes. Oh boy, here we go again. Per one and two and three in the cry. And also look at this. Another clock gene is the retinoic acid orphan receptor, okay, which acts as a transcription factor in what? 
TH17 cells in pro-inflammation. Remember that? That's another clock gene. Isn't that interesting? That receptor is. Remember, that's a transcription factor receptor. All those are associated with longer MFS. What's that? Metastatic disease, okay? Or it, it actually higher expression of those genes gives you a longer metastasis-free survival in cancer patients. Metastasis-free survival if you have higher expression of these clock genes, presumably because you have normal sleep-wake cycles, perhaps through the NFIL-3 pathway and the ROAR gamma T via the ROAR-C, okay? And that's using a univariate Cox regression analysis. So the statistics look pretty good on this paper. In the multivariant Cox analysis model, only the PER3 gene and the ROAR-C, remember that's the retinoic acid, which involves TH17 activation, were found to be associated with survival outcome, independent of all other established clinical pathological parameters. Now, what does that say? Look at this. There's one more level of this paper, which I really like the fact that they did this. They did pairwise. They looked at multiple transcription factors and multiple potential activators of cell cycle. And because we know from our experience looking at T cell, T cell activation differentiation and division. Pairwise correlation between functionally related clock genes, pair two, three coupled together, as do CRY2 pair three, were stronger in low grade carcinomas. Huh. And then interesting, whereas weaker correlation coefficients were observed in high-grade tumors and tumors that did progress to the metastatic disease. This is now, again, uh, breast cancer. So the loss of control over clock gene expression bodes poor prognosis in breast cancer in a complex gene-associated array analysis. Sorry, I didn't put the space between those two words. All right. So let's do a propositional diavent ontological analysis based on what we just learned from the literature. Given the association of NFIL3, which we've been talking about at great length through these six lectures, and T cell differentiation, remember TH17 versus Treg, remember that NFIL basically blocks Treg activation differentiation in favor of the pro-inflammatory T cell lineages. And in fact, infill 3 can turn a T reg cell into a TH2 type cell. I talked about that, I think, in lecture four of the series. So given the association of infill 3 and T cell differentiation, clock gene linkage, and the potential for sleep cycle de deprivation, right, insomnia, there may be a correlation with metastasis in breast cancer and maybe other cancers according to the rhythmic changes in key transcription factors, like ROAR gamma T, right? Like NFIL-3, that tip the balance of Treg versus TH cell differentiation and activation. So that's something you could propose based on the literature, and that's using a die-event ontological paradigmatic look. What I mean by that is we're looking at genetics, we're looking at the neuroimmunoepigenome, and of course, we're looking at the environment. The environment are changes in because of, say, an oncogenic event in the host, in the, in the living system, in the human, in the existing individual, okay? So that's what we just did there. So I showed you this slide before, just showing you that you have these CHL, the common helper, um, immune-like progenitor cells that can be converted to an ID2 activated uh, pathway that can give rise to all of these innate lymphoid cells. I wanted to show you, remind you that innate lymphoid cells are just as potent in these responses as our frank Treg T helper cell lineages. And notice where an infill controls ID2 differentiation. And when you have ID2 differentiation, you make all of these innate lymphoid cells, all of which, some of which are going to have the ROAR gamma T transcription factor activation. All these cells are going to be involved. And look at here. They're going to control cellular processes, including growth, senescence, differentiation, apoptosis, angiogenesis, neoplastic transformation, right? They inhibit skeletal muscle and cardiac myocyte differentiation. They regulate the circadian clock. These cells do. Now we know how, or at least we have a inroad using our diet event ontological paradigmatic discussion I'm, I'm trying to inter introduce to you by looking at these clock gene interactions and making heterodimers. So this has been well studied, okay? Here's the paper published in Cell Reports in 2015 talking about this. So you see how I'm taking current papers, 
2014 papers, 2018 papers, and 2015 papers, combining them to give you an idea of how all of this crosstalk in immune cells help understand the uh, pyramidal trigonal interaction I call the dia event ontological paradigm. Okay. You need to watch those previous uh, lectures to know exactly how it fits together, but I'm telling you now that this is, this is what I'm trying to show you, an example of how you can use my paradigm to look at the scientific research, look at the published research, and come up maybe, if you're a pharmaceutical company, better approaches to know what to target if you want to knock out, say, an autoimmune disease, or you want to help regulate, for example, that life cycle of that terrible tapeworm whose species name I kept on screwing up. You see how this works, right? You can look at parasitic infections. You can look at metastasis in breast cancer, right? Or you can look, as we're going to see subsequently, autoimmune diseases. And also just the frank immune responses that are related to infection by virus, fungus, or bacteria in humans. Okay. So again, all this is involved with these clock genes. I just want you to get an idea that, that you NFIL3 is regulating the expression of all these innate lymphoid cells, all of which are going to be involved in the regulation of those physiological and pathophysiological responses that we just went through. Okay. Now, a couple more things. Natural killer cells and natural killer T cells, okay, those are two different types. There are two types of important cells in innate immunity. Innate immunity triggers a nonspecific immune response, as we've said many times, against infectious agents prior to the activation of the specificity associated with presenting with antigen using a professional APC cells, antigen presenting cells. Uh, and that's, of course, the adaptive immune response, T cell, B cell responses. So neutrophils, macrophages, mast cells, those are all innate cells, and dendritic cells, all of those can be APCs. Um, and they're involved, of course, in what we call innate immunity, immediate responders. Both natural killer and natural killer T lymphocytes are cytotoxic cells, which induce cell death of pathogenic cells forthwith, straight on, as well as tumor cells when they can detect them. Okay. Now that has a lot to do with these immune checkpoint inhibitors that is relieving the immunosuppression of those cell lineages so that you get the killing of tumor cells nascent before they become metastatic. You see how this is linked back to things like INFIL3, ROR gamma T, clock genes, and even sleep-wake cycles, right? All of which can also link to what? Neuropsychiatric diseases. Now, are these loose connections? No, they're very tight connections because we're looking at what? The end of phenotype. We're looking at the expression of specific transcription genes. We already know what they're doing to T lymphocyte, mediate differentiation activation, and ultimately apoptosis and removal. And then therefore affect on the physiology, pathophysiology, and ultimately back to normal physiological responses when you don't have an auto-inflammatory um, disease. Okay. So that's all really important to put in mind. So this comes from the British Society of Immunology, Hagrin Jenner Institute, just showing you that the innate natural killer T lymphocytes can interact with dendritic cells. So just read here, invariant natural killer cells are also known as INKTs. Uh, or type one or classical natural killer T lymphocytes are a distinct population of T cells expressed in an invariant beta T cell receptor. Okay, so they have one kind, an invariant form of it. Remember that normally is altered by recombination. Right? And a number of cell surface molecules in common with natural killer cells. Although the uh, INKT cells are rare in human blood, they comprise only about 0.01 to maybe up to 1% of, of uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. They are important immunoregulatory cells, nevertheless, because they rapidly produce large amounts of cytokines and influence all the other immune cells. And that's what we're showing you here. They turn on uh, via interferon gamma, natural killer cells, as via hyolytic function. They also can activate dendritic cells, and then those dendritic cells will activate and mature, and then they'll turn on the CD4 cell lineage and CD8 cell lineage. And we already know those are naive T cells, which are ultimately going to turn on all the T cell lineages we've talked about in previous lectures. So look at how this natural killer T lymphocyte, which is supposed to just go around killing cells like cancer cells or maybe bacterial cells because they're going around looking for such uh, disorganized cellular lineages. They're also involved in backstaging all this other interaction, which is a much more potent and virile way of controlling T, C, T cell lymphocyte inflammatory responses, and of course, the suppression of those by T rex. So y'all, yeah, this is all associated with the recognition of antigen. So the INKT cells express a restricted TCR repertoire, very limited amount of recombinant, recombinants on that protein. 
In humans, it's composed of the variable 24JA, 18TCRA alpha chain, preferentially coupled with the uh, variable B11 TCR beta chain. So it's specifically where these interact. This is the kind of T cell limited repertoire you're looking at. So this has been well studied, but this is in the immunology journals. So we wanna take what's in the immunology journals and put it say in the parasitic journals or, or use it to inform people who are studying parasitic infections and maybe pharmaceutical companies that wanna know what to trigger way back at the level of these variable chains as they're expressed in a specific lineage of T killer cells called in the invariant natural killer T cells because they regulate then all these other pathways. Amazing, right? All right. So unlike a, a conventional T cells, which mostly recognize peptide antigens presented by major histocompatibility complex molecules, the INT T cells, as we've been saying, recognize glycolipid antigens. Now that's interesting because there's also something called the phospholipid disease, which I haven't talked about yet in great detail, but I did a long time ago in one of the really early authentic biochemistry um, uh, video uh, broadcasts. And I'll go back and I'll talk about that later when I'm doing a podcast on it. Uh, by non-polymorphic MHC class one molecules, the CD1D. So the INKT cells are frequently characterized with recognition of the prototypical glycolipid, which is a galactoceramide, which I've talked about ceramide lipids. Those are sphingolipids, right? And a marine sponge derived agent, which also potently activates them and has strong anti-tumor activity. So there's all kinds of ways for some pharmaceutical companies to be able to get involved in studying these basic generalized pathways by using diet event ontological paradigmatic perspectives. All right. So it's just giving you a difference between natural killer cells. They prefer, uh, they refer to a smaller type of killer cells. Large granule lymphocytes mature according to circulation. They possess these FC receptors and inhibitory receptors. They contain cytoplasmic granules. The NKTs are T cells that destroy infected cells and tumor cells without prior sensitization, as you just said. They're a type of T cell. They do possess that invariant TCR. All right. So we're not going to talk about cytotoxic T lymphocytes now. We're going to just finish with this. T lymphocytes are immunopromiscuous potent acquired immune cells that do not necessarily follow limiting or terminal lineages or differentiation and thus are not internally canonically differentiated. Understand that. Regulation and subclass alteration are not vectorially determined by specific ratios of effector molecules. It's much more complex than that. So as I'm saying here, we have Th1, Th2, and Th17, and Tregs. We have acytotoxic T lymphocytes. We have natural killer T cells we just covered, as well as innate lymphoid cells, which I covered, I, I think, in lectures two and three of this uh, arc. They're all pseudo-stochastically differentiated and activated and stabilized via epigenetic. And in fact, I talked previously on bioenergetic glucose versus fatty acid metabolism mediation as I talk a specific foreign antigens and thus are regulated by distinct transcription factors, cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, and even lipids. All right. So I'm going to end the show there. And we're going to do what I always do at this cycle or stage of my video lectures. We're going to end by saying bye for now.